We're dealing with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. This is the third theophany that we've seen, or that is the temporary appearance of a pre-incarnate Christ. Genesis 18, if you'll turn there. Also we have here the promise of the birth of Isaac. And the Lord appeared unto him, speaking here of Abraham, in the plain of Mamre, as he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day, and lift up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. And he addresses them with uh, the divine term and said, My Lord, if now I found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. So Abraham knows he's dealing here with uh, more than just men. They're called men, but God often appears in the Old Testament, pre-incarnate Christ, as an angel or as a man, once as the captain of the Lord's host. You see here from what is said and done that we're dealing with deity. Abraham says, Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. And you might note here in passing that the church of our day teaches that feet washing was just a custom of the early Christians, our early peoples, when uh, they didn't have the shoes and paved streets that we have today, and so it was just a custom of uh, hospitality to wash someone's feet. But the um, practice was that you washed your own feet. And here, even though he's dealing with deity, you notice he tells the Lord to wash his own feet because that's the way it was done. So what's set forth in John 13 when we wash someone else's feet is not just the custom of hospitality. So let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts after that you pass on. For therefore you come to your servant. They said, So do as thou hast said. So Abraham hasted unto the tent, into the tent unto Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes for the hearth. And Abraham ran unto the herd, and fetched a calf tender and good, and gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it, and took butter and milk, and the calf which he had dressed, and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, Now this is one of the men talking, who is more than a man, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life, and lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? You notice that's a small L. And the Lord said, You see, this man now is called the Lord again. And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which I am, which am old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Uh, he's referring here to the fact she's going to conceive now and bear a son, and that he'll return in nine months. And Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid when she saw that he had the word of knowledge, you see. And so he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. And the men rose from thence and looked toward Sodom. Now they're called men here, from now from Lord. See, it's the Lord with two angels with him is what it is. And the, and the men rose from thence and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, and he will command his children and his household after, after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. And the Lord said, Because of the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it which has come up unto me, and if not, I will know it. Well, again, he's using here language that uh, is what is called, as I say, anthropomorphical. Or he's not always uh, saying, now, I'm God, so I knew already what's there, but he's appearing as a man, so he's just simply 
speaking to Abraham, said, I'm going to go down now and see if it's the way I, I heard it was. We're obviously dealing with deity, so he already knew what was there. We come to verse 22, and we have Abraham's intercessory prayer. We have um, the promise of Isaac first, and then in verses 17 to 22, the revelation concerning the fate of Sodom. And starting with verse 23, we have Abraham's prayer. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous men within the city. Wilt thou, also, wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked. And that the righteous should be as the wicked and be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said he would spare Sodom if he finds 50 righteous. Now, very obviously, we can't read all of the Old Testament, so I just fill in where we can skip. And then he says, what if you find 45? He said, I'll spare it for 45 and 40. And it gets him down finally to um, 10. Verse 32, he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure, ten shall be found there. He said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. As you read and study Scripture, see, you can put things together yourself. You see, over and over, he's called both a man and he's called the Lord. So uh, then you can figure out that sometimes God did appear in the Old Testament as a man, as an angel, and so on. Abraham reveals his own knowledge here of the wickedness of Sodom because uh, he just kept reducing the number because he wasn't sure either that they could find 50 righteous or 40 righteous or 30 or 20 or 10. If he'd have said one, I'm sure the Lord would have spared Sodom for one righteous person. There were none, is the point. Now, I don't know why we think it's strange that God has pronounced judgment upon America because uh, it's as wicked as Sodom and Gomorrah. I imagine most of you know the stories from Sunday school, two angels. Uh, now, that these are the other two men with him, with the Lord. Now they're called angels, chapter 19. And there came the two angels to Sodom at evening, and you know the story how they came, and the men, the Sodomites, you know what sodomy is, homosexuality. And that's uh, where we get the name Sodomites from this city because the whole city was given over to uh, unnatural affection and they even tried to seduce these angels. And of course Lot came to, uh, they came into Lot's house, Lot took them in and Lot even offered his daughters because he said, uh, because he knew that, uh, that these men were divine and uh, from God, and so he felt that a worse crime to, to make a proposition to them than for them to misuse his daughters. Now, I'm sure you know all of that, as I say, from Bible reading. And let me say something else. I trust, too, that we're all mature enough that you can keep ahead on your reading without me making assignments. Don't wait till we get to class, like, to read the next few chapters in Genesis. I mean, for freshmen in college or high school, we, we you know, we make assignments. But... Don't wait till you get here because you won't know what's in between. There's no way in the world to read the whole Old Testament. And so you want to keep reading ahead. You want to keep reading in Unger. If we're studying Genesis, then you want to see what he has to say about Genesis. And you uh, trust you read all of Tenney uh, at your leisure. You set up your own schedule of study. We gave you that the first, first period when we started this school. But if you don't know what I'm talking about, you see, if you don't know what happens in chapter 19 of Genesis, then you're missing uh, much of what I'm trying to say because uh, the whole key to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah is right here in chapter 19, why he's doing it. All right, so a uh, word to the wise ought to be sufficient. He couldn't find any righteous and uh, the angels, uh, verse 15, tried to get Lot and his family to flee. When the morning arose, the angels hastened to Lot and said, Arise, take thy wife, thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. See, even though they warned Lot that they were going to destroy, God was going to destroy the city, he lingered. Now, Lot knew he should go, but... When one attaches himself to the world, you see, even though he knows he's in danger, yet it's hard to break away. 
So it came to pass, when they had brought them forth abroad, they had to actually carry them out of the city. He said, Escape for thy life, and look not behind thee. Now that's very important because of what happened to his wife. He said, Look, don't even look behind, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, O oh, not so, my lord. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest the evil take me, and I die. So he asked to be able to go to a certain city. Somehow Lot liked to pitch his tents toward all the cities. And so they, uh, they let him do that. He went to the city of Zor, verse 22. The sun had risen on the earth when Lot entered Zor. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And so there is another passage which shows the plurality of the Godhead. Chapters 18 and 19, this man is called the Lord. And if you'd see that in the Hebrew, that's why this Lord is capitalized where the Lord, when Sarah called her husband Lord, it was a small L, which means sir, mister, that sort of thing, husband. But uh, here the Lord, standing there, rained fire from the Lord. So the Son is raining fire from the Father in heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities, and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him she became a pillar of salt. See, she, they were forbidden to look behind in verse 17. Now, the looking behind isn't just looking back, but it's looking back with that longing, I don't want to leave. You know, hesitating, stopping, looking back. When Jesus said in Luke 14, uh, Luke 9, he that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God, he doesn't mean that uh, if we ever look back to the world, in the sense of a thought about it or the flesh lusting momentarily after the old life uh, that you would be cut off, but he means looking back in the sense of going back. And so while uh, Lot's wife got out of Sodom, Sodom never got out of Lot's wife, and that's why she was destroyed. It's like Israel. Israel was delivered from Egypt, but we could, God could never deliver Egypt from Israel. They kept wanting to go back. So he destroys Sodom and Gomorrah, and verse 30, we see the consequences of Lot's uh, stay in Sodom and the influence upon his children in the verses that follow. And Lot went up to Zor and dwelt in a mountain, he and his two daughters with him, for he feared to, feared to dwell in Zor, so he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. And the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, there's not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. In other words, said nobody to marry us. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that he may preserve seed. We may preserve seed of our father. They made their father drink wine that night. The firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he perceived not when she lay down, down or when she arose. It came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father, now let us make him drink wine this night also. Go thou in and lie with him, that we may preserve the seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger rose, lay with him, and perceive, he perceived not when she lay down when she arose. Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. And the firstborn bare a son and called his name Moab, and that's where the Moabites come from. And the younger bare a son called his name Ben-Ami, son of Ami, and they are the Ammonites. Those two tribes, uh, even though Lot was a nephew of Abraham and the son of Abraham's brother and uh, could have produced children that would have been a part of Israel, you see. Uh, yet, because of his relationship there in Sodom and Gomorrah, you see the influence upon the daughters. They use uh, wrong means to preserve the family name and line. That was the purpose in it. And so the result was we get the Moabites and Ammonites, which were always in trouble with Israel. And, of course, those two names occur over and over in the Scripture and often are at war with Israel. And, of course, Amman is the capital. Amman is the capital of Jordan today, uh, the Arab nation of Jordan. Uh, across uh, the river, Jordan, here is the nation of Jordan, the Arab nation, and they are constantly at war and conflict with Israel. So, as we said, that shows the influence of um, Sodom even upon the children. Then chapter 20, we have a, an encounter of Abraham with Abimelech, a king. Remember, kings are not always um, of kings of large nations, but he's the king of Gerar. Same 
experience with Pharaoh when he down, went down to Egypt. He again uh, feared for his life, so uh, Sarah said that she was his sister, and that's true. But Abimelech, verse 4, had not come near her. But God appeared to Abimelech in a dream by night and said unto him, Behold, thou art a dead man. <laughs> Because he took Sarah. For the woman which I was taken, she's a man's wife. See, these kings, Pharaoh and every little tribal chief, if they saw a woman they liked, they just, uh, just killed the husband and took her. They didn't ask his opinion. Whoever had the most men could take the women. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she's my sister. And of course, remember, Abraham told the truth. He just didn't tell all he knew. And she even herself said, he is my brother. And that's the truth, too. They were related. The integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have done this. Well, bless his old pagan heart. He's trying to get out of it. <laughs> and God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. See, to have touched Sarah, he would have sinned against God, because Sarah is barren. While it isn't a virgin birth, it's going to be a supernatural birth when Isaac's born you see, because she's barren, just like uh, Rachel was barren. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her, so God prevented it, you see. You'd be surprised what God prevents in our lives. He prevents people from sinning against you and you sinning against him. Now, that doesn't mean that he just takes complete charge of your life, but there are areas here that, uh, that you need to see in Scripture, that God takes care of his children. Many times he keeps you from sinning against him, but he isn't going to do that absolutely. You just have to take that as a part of your understanding of who God is and how he works. Now, therefore, restore the man to his wife. Now, look at this, the first mention of a prophet in Scripture. He is a prophet. Did you know Abraham was a prophet? First mentioned in Scripture. Now, he's not the first in Scripture. Uh, Enoch was a prophet. He prophesied, according to Jude, of the return of the Lord with ten thousands of his saints. That's us. He prophesied that right after the Garden of Eden. The Lord one day would return with ten thousands of his saints. Not ten thousand, but thousands. He's a prophet, and he'll pray for you, and you shall live. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. Then we have in chapter 21 the birth of Isaac. The fulfillment of the divine promise, chapter 21, verses 1 to 7, the fulfillment of the promise. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. Again, we know that was the Lord over there in chapter 18. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare a son, Abraham a son, in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac, meaning laughter. Sarah laughed. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, and as God had commanded him. Remember the covenant of circumcision, chapter 17. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, so that all that hear will laugh with me. So Isaac in Hebrew is Yitzchak. Yitzchak. Doesn't start with an I, it starts with a Y. I've never understood the transliteration of names in Scripture, in translations, I mean. Pathetic. They don't even come close most of the time. And she said, Who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck? For I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. All right, so God fulfills his word. Then in verses 18 and 21, we have the expulsion of Hagar and Ishmael. Without reading it, they mock. Ishmael knows he's the firstborn and that he's going to have the inheritance rights, he thinks, because he doesn't know that God, uh, that, that God had promised a son through Abraham through whom all the promises would come. And so because of the competition and fear of Sarah, lest uh, Ishmael take Isaac's inheritance and blessings, she puts them out. And God concurs in this. God said, verse 12, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad, because of the bondwoman. And all that Sarah has said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for Isaac in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So God had to allow this time a woman's voice, that is the wife's voice, to prevail over her husband because 
God did not want Ishmael and Hagar there lest the inheritance be marred because the Messiah was going to come through the promise, not through Abraham and Sarah's attempt to give God an heir, Abraham an heir for God. But he promises her, uh, verse 13, of the son of the bondwoman, I'll make, a, I'll make a nation because he is thy seed. You see, God's going to bless Ishmael. So Ishmael becomes the father of the Ishmaelites, quite an important people in Old Testament times in the biblical world. Verses 22 to 33, we, Abraham makes an alliance with Abimelech. And uh, they make it at Beersheba. Then chapter 22, we come to Abraham's offering of Isaac. God's test of Isaac. The command is in verses 1 and 2. It came to pass after these things that God did try, not tempt, poor translation, did try Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, I'm here. The reason God didn't tempt Abraham because we're told in James 1 that God can't be tempted himself, therefore tempts he no man to sin. And so... Um, had you been living back in the time King James translated this, uh, some words would not have bothered you because a temp could, would mean try then. But a lot of words have changed meaning. This is a poor translation for us. And God did try Abraham. Verse 2, he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a, human, for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now, God later in Leviticus uh, condemns human sacrifice. So this is not God approving or contradicting himself because God knows what he's going to do. He's not going to let it happen, but he's trying Abraham's faith. And so Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him. This is his response in verses 3 to 10. And took Isaac and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place which God had told him, to Moriah. Later on, by the way, Mount Moriah, where he sacrifices, uh, offers uh, Isaac, is where Solomon builds the temple, right on the same spot. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young son, Abide ye here with the ass, and I, I and the lad will go yonder. Said to the young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Now there's an expression of faith. Now, if you know what Hebrews 11 says, Abraham, Paul says of Abraham, when he offered up Isaac, he believed that God was able to raise him from the dead. So he actually was going through with this. But you notice his expression of faith here. He says, we will go worship and come back. We will return. And so that's why he was justified by his faith. That's what James means in chapter 2. He isn't contradicting Paul. James says, see, when I, see how that when Abraham offered Isaac on the altar that you're justified by faith and works. You see, f a faith that works. You see, he believed God for a son. Now God said, take the son through whom all the blessings will come. Offer him as a sacrifice. Well, then how could God fulfill all of those promises that your seed will be as the sand of the sea, the stars of heaven for multitude? He wouldn't have an heir. And God said they will all come through Isaac, all these promises. So Abraham had to exercise his faith to believe God would raise him up. And so his faith would, have been no, would not have been genuine had he not followed through and acted his faith and offered Isaac, believing that God would raise him up. So he's, his faith is at work. That's what James is saying. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it upon Isaac his son, he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. Isaac said to Abraham, his father, spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb. <laughs> Again, if you're perceptive in Scripture, that is a prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. God will provide a lamb. See, because later on, we know from this account, he provides a substitute for Isaac, and that's what Jesus is, a substitute. And John said, John 1, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. So they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him upon the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, 
Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. So a type of Christ in the offering. And God, Abraham lifted up his eyes, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns, and Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for burnt offering in the stead of his son. And there's your first teaching on a substitute, definite teaching. Of course, the slaying of the animals uh, in the early chapters of Genesis are types of substitutes too. And Abraham called the name of that place, he didn't call it Jehovah, he called it Yahweh Yehreh, the Lord sees. Yahweh Yehreh. Chapter 20, 2, 1 to 19 deals with the Isaac, and then 22, verses 20 and 23, we have the genealogy of Nahar, who was uh, Abraham's brother. It's given because Nahar's line is linked with that of Abraham. We don't have to read that, of course. And in chapter 23, we have the death of Sarah. Sarah died at the age of 127, and Sarah was 107 and 20 years old. And Sarah died in Kirjath Arba, the same as Hebron. In the land of Canaan. And chapter 23 deals with a very interesting custom of the day, how Abraham went and purchased a burial site, uh, a field that had a cave in it and became a sepulcher where he later was buried and Isaac and Jacob later were buried too. Now Abraham was given all of Palestine and yet uh, he doesn't live to see uh, himself in possession of it. He takes it by faith. Please stop your machine at this point and turn the tape over. Now Abraham was given all of Palestine and yet uh, he doesn't live to see uh, himself in possession of it. He takes it by faith. He was just a pilgrim passing through and his descendants are given it four centuries later. So he has to buy this field even though he owns it. It's already given to him. But he like couldn't walk up to the Canaanite and say, you know, this is mine. The Lord gave it to me. This is what the Israelites are doing now. And of course, they, the Arabs laugh at them. But they do have the Old Testament on their side. Just before uh, Nasser died, he was taking up a study of the Old Testament to see, to try to understand the mentality of the Jews that kept saying all that belonged to them. And had he lived long enough, he had discovered that God gave it to them for an eternal possession. Chapter 24, we have the betrothal of Isaac and Rebekah. Abraham refuses to seek a wife among the Canaanites, so he sends his servant back to where he came from, Haran. So we have uh, Abraham sending back to Haran, that's a long way off, uh, to his uh, kinfolks. See, they, it, in early periods, they could marry cousins and all of that, where later on, uh, marrying too close was uh, an abomination to the Lord, and he allowed it early because, like uh, Adam and Eve, uh, bear sons and daughters, and then they had to marry one another, you see. And so that was all right in the beginning. And then later on, uh, if you marry too close, it has congenital hereditary problems. So Abraham sends, the, uh, serv sends a servant back to... He takes gifts and camels and all, and the story there, again, I'm sure you must know from Sunday school. If you don't, then you should be reading ahead and uh, uh, get the blessing out of what's happening here in the book of Genesis because it's the foundation for everything else in the Old and New Testament. And we're not making a study, you see, of the book of Genesis. We're making a survey of the whole Old Testament, and uh, it's up to you to do the reading. But to see that God is in this selection, verse 12, the servant said he's, he's now way up there in Mesopotamia near Haran, and he said, Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto thy, to my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water, and let it come to pass. Now he's laying out a fleece, which is all right 
for baby Christians and beginners. I've done it, but the Lord has shown me for, for mature Christians this is not the way because the devil can use sense evidence. And he can control circumstances too. And if you start laying out too many fleeces, then you'll get fleeced. And so it's all right here because they didn't have the spirit within them like you've got to lead and direct you. They didn't have the word. You've got both. God wants you to learn his word and to learn to be sensitive to the voice of his spirit. And he will direct you where to go and what to do. Well, anyway, he laid out a fleece. Let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink, and she shall say, drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac, and thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. Now, that's a pretty definite fleece. He's, here's what I'm going to say. Here's what she's to say. Here's to be her response. But the interesting thing is, I'll know, Lord, that it's the one you have ordained for him. So God does ordain who you should marry. So you should seek his guidance. <laughs> I don't know why it's... Well, don't say it's too late. <laughs> because uh, believe, that, believe that he was directing in, in your life. But for those of you who are not yet, uh, have not met yet taken the plunge, uh, <laughs> ask the Lord to direct you to the right husband or wife. He will. That's the Bible. You should. Marriages are made in heaven. The right kind. Well, he did that, and so Rebecca comes up, and here's where I got the name of our last daughter, Rivka in Hebrew, Rivka. Rebecca in English. I don't know how they got Rebecca out of Reef Ka, but that's some more of this beautiful, meaningless translation. In fact, one of the, two of the few names that are translated properly in from Hebrew or Greek to English is Abraham. That's Avraham, and that is a good translation. I don't know why they gave us a good one there, because all the others, most of them miss it. And Jesus, it's Jesus in Greek. So he did that, and Rebekah came up, said what he said, and at verse 29, Rebekah had a brother, and his name was Laban, and Laban ran out to meet the man, and so the servant said that uh, Abraham had a son, Isaac, and uh, he sent him here to find a wife from among his people, but he didn't want to marry among the heathen and the Canaanites, and so to make a long story short, Laban gives her sister to the servant to take back to Isaac. Now, we shouldn't get the impression as we read these accounts that, uh, like, Isaac, you know, is uh, born and now he's 18 or 19, his father sends out to get a wife. No, I, uh, Isaac is 40 years old before he thinks about getting married. <laughs> I thought that was somebody single out there groaning. But, uh, I look, but he's, he's, he's married, so I... But, uh, yeah, he's 40, and... Uh, Remember Boaz? He was an elderly person. I don't mean old, but elderly. And uh, Ruth attached herself to him because that was in the divine will and providence. Remember what Boaz said? You've not followed the young men or the rich, but you've chosen wisely. <laughs> <laughs> so people didn't, uh, uh, a lot of people didn't get married and uh, didn't have the opportunity, and those who did didn't always marry young. It's very unusual to marry as young as we do in America anyway in other cultures taken Europe often they're in their late 20s or 30s well I don't know what that's got to do with anything except to say that you don't want the picture well he was born and he was sacrificed as a little boy he's big enough to carry wood wood of the sacrifice was on Isaac's back and uh, he was probably in his 20s all right <clears throat> so we come to chapter 25, and we have the death of Abraham. And uh, before, we, uh, before he dies, though, he has a marriage uh, to Keturah. Then Abraham took another wife. Her name was Keturah. This is after Sarah has died. She bare him Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Now, Midian is the one that should stand out because... The, that Abraham is the father not only of the Ishmaelites, the Israelites, but the Midianites. Now, we do have them on here. See, the Midianites, they were quite a 
strong and uh, well-known people in biblical times, Midianites. So here's where Midianites come from. One of his sons was named Midian. But verse 5, Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, you see. But unto the sons of the concubines, verse 6, which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac his son while he yet lived eastward into the east country. Now eastward into the east country, of course, Mediterranean Sea is in the west, Palestine, west of the Jordan is always west, and so anytime they say eastward, they mean east of the Jordan River. Over here is Babylon and Ammon, Moab, Midianites, Babylon, Assyria, and so on. And Abraham gave up the ghost. Well, that isn't what the Hebrew said. <laughs> he didn't have the ghost. He gave up the spirit and died in a good old age. An old man, full of years, and was gathered to his people. And his son Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah. That's the cave that he bought uh, from the Hittite, which is before Mamre, the field of Ephraim the Hittite. And these are the days of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived, a hundred, three score, and fifteen. How much is that? 175. Pretty good, wasn't it? What was Sarah again? 127, wasn't it? So he, he lived a long time after Sarah. See, she was ten years younger, and um, he lived to be 175, almost 200 years old. And he had a lot of a lot of descendants, even while he was living. Then we have the generations of Ishmael, another Toledoth, 25 verses 12 to 18. Another Toledoth. Remember what they are. There are 11 of them in Genesis. The whole book of Genesis is built upon a structure of generations, genealogies. Then the stories are attached to those pegs. And then chapter 25, beginning with verse 19, and going through chapter 35, verse 29, we have the generations of Isaac, the Toledoth of Isaac, the histories, generations, that's what the word Toledoth means. Now the remainder of Isaac's life after Abraham's death is linked closely to his two sons. All right, verse 20. Verse 19, these are the generations of Isaac. Verse 20, and Isaac was 40 years old. There's where I got it. When he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padanamaram, the sister of Laban the Syrian. So uh, uh, right, let's see, he married. Yes, he married right in his own family because um, the Abraham's brother went up there he and Nahor. So he's marrying, marrying his family. All right, and Rebekah, and Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife, verse 21, because she was barren, just like Sarah. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. So this barrenness is often emphasized in Scripture among outstanding people in the genealogy of Jesus because so often God wants to stress that what happens is supernatural. So here again, she's barren. Uh, just like Sarah. Now God predicts certain things here. Verse 22, the children struggled within her, and she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire the Lord, and the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb. You notice he didn't say two people, but two nations. And two manner of people should be separated from thy bowels. And the one people should be stronger than the other people. And the elder shall serve the younger. See, that's just the opposite, the way it should be, or it was in those days. Firstborn got all of the rights to the inheritance. So God predicts here, two nations will come out of her womb. One nation will serve another. The weaker will serve the stronger. And the elder shall serve the younger. This will help explain this prophecy here by God will ex help explain why all through Scripture uh, God says that it is Jacob that he chose and Esau that he rejected. Now, Esau by his life proved that he was not regenerate and would therefore have to be rejected, but from God's side, remember the two sides to everything that happens. 
God's plan comes before anybody's birth or sin or righteousness. God's plan comes first. That's predestination. And so this helps explain the significance of what is said like in the prophecy of Malachi, like in Romans 9, where God said, says twice, Esau I've hated, Jacob I've loved. He said, I loved Jacob and hated Esau before they were ever born, before they did good or bad. Take it up with the Lord, friends. That's the God of the Bible, not the God of the church of this day that's on his knees pleading with sinners to accept him. Uh, don't, don't misunderstand that statement either if you just happen to be a visitor here today. But um, that's the way it is, Romans 9. Just so you know that that's in the Bible, we might just point that out. Verse 7 of Romans 9, Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they children, but in Isaac, God said, In Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of the promise, At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived, now it's jumping to Rebekah, our text right now, where we are. When Rebekah had conceived by one, even our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election, God elects to salvation. And he did it before eternity. You see, you've got, whether you can understand it or not, let's just say what the Bible says. And over the period of months, we'll try to get enough of the word in you that you can, you can accept in your heart what your head is already accepting because if you can read, there's what it says. You have to accept it or just throw it all out. Throw John 3.16 out with it. You can't pick and choose in the Bible. I mean, churches do, and denominations do, and professing Christians do, but you, you can't do it and get away with it. God won't let you. So God, before they'd done either good or evil, so that the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works. So it's before they did good or bad, he chose Jacob. Or it would be, he, you see, all of this argument by the Arminian church today, and 99% of all churches are Arminian. That means that it's, they're humanistic. They're always emphasizing what man does, not what God does. And they say, well, yes, God elected. He looked down through eternity and saw who would believe, so he elected all those. Well, right here disproves that. He, do, he didn't look at Jacob's faith and Esau's faithlessness and choose them. He said before they'd done anything. So that election can only be grace, friends, or it is an election. You don't elect God, he elects you. So it's not of works, but of him that calls. So that the election would be of all of grace, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now we'll be dealing with the doctrine of election. We've dealt with the doctrine of predestination, foreknowledge, and so on. One day when we can get, get over to that place where it belongs in the study of systematic theology, uh, on Wednesdays we'll get to election. You'll be able to see it more clearly. You have to let God be God. So that's what it says. Now there's more to it than that, but it's just like it says in Romans 9. If it's election, then it's grace. And we have to leave it there. So that you can understand what's being said in Malachi and Romans 9, that's why this is said here, that God is already predicting that he is the one choosing the younger over the elder. He's choosing Jacob, but Esau's born first. So somehow Jacob has to get the birthright and get the blessing, get the inheritance. And by, by uh, law and custom, it goes to Esau. Well, when her days were delivered, to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that, his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. And his name was called Supplanter. That's what Jacob means in Hebrew. He's going to supplant him, take his place. And uh, he was already 
they were already struggling in the womb together. We're told that up there. Verse 22, they were struggling together in the womb. They struggled, all, and they're still struggling. You see, they've struggled with the Israelites. Esau fought with Jacob in the womb, fought with him, tried to threaten his life because Jacob took the birthright. And uh, their descendants have fought from then on. Well, the boys grew, and Esau became a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Well, <laughs> you know, the Bible tells it like it is. God loved Jacob and Isaac loved Esau. Isn't that strange? And Jacob sawed pottage. <laughs> How about that? Jacob sawed pottage. Well, good old King James English. Jacob made pottage. And Esau came from the field and was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom, meaning red. See, Esau became the father of the Edomites. So Esau's name was called Edom, which means red. And even the country is red. And he uh, was named, first of all, because of the red pottage that he wanted. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. Verse 31. And Esau said, Behold, I'm at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he sware to him and sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drank and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now, the reason that God so uh, God is so uh, um, harsh with Esau and says that he hated him before he was born, and that's what he says, so don't try to make it something else, and loved, es and loved Jacob, is because Esau proves God's choice was right. Esau isn't just selling his right to material inheritance. He did give up that, the birthright, because he was firstborn. But he's selling, and Esau knows he's doing it, all of the spiritual promises God gave to Abraham, that through your seed, and it would always come through the eldest son. And here it wouldn't go through Jacob, it would go through Esau. But God had already selected Jacob, so it would have to be this way from God's side. But Esau is giving up his spiritual blessing, that through him all the world would be blessed. I mean, it is, uh, it is the depth of his unregenerate heart that is set forth here, that he despised the spiritual aspect of the promises that God had made. So this is why he is rejected from God's side. And by the way, in Hebrews 12, that is set forth about uh, Esau. Of chapter 26 we have Isaac and his uh, experience with Abimelech is another account just like Abraham had uh, an experience with Pharaoh and an, this is not the same Abimelech that Abraham had the experience with in chapter 20 where he said to Sarah tell them tell Pharaoh tell Abimelech that you're my sister uh, the same thing happens here to Isaac he tells Rebecca say you're my sister and again they're telling the truth because they've married into the same family brother and sister that is not literally brother and sister but a relative and so he follows the same policy of Abraham I guess Abraham told his experiences and so Isaac said to Rebecca do that so the same thing happens and uh, by the way God renews his covenant with uh, from uh, covenant he made with Abraham through Isaac, verse 4, verse 3, sojourn in this land, God said, don't go down into Egypt. He said, I'll give thee all these countries. I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of the heaven. I will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Uh, and so Abraham obeyed his voice and kept his charge. And Isaac dwelt in Gerar. And the men, uh, here's where he says, she's my sister. 
But verse 8, he kind of gives himself away. It came to pass when he'd been there a long time that Abimelech, the king of Philistines, looked out of a window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. Now, he wasn't playing uh, kickball or <laughs> <laughs> badminton, badminton, or tiddlywinks, or checkers. Because, uh, well, it was a husband and life, wife relationship. And he obviously would never saw any brother kiss a sister like whatever, you know, that was probably what he was doing, you know, they were just embracing one another. And so he calls him in, he said, uh, Behold of a surety, she's thy wife, and you said she's my sister. And Isaac said, Because I said, lest I die for her. Well, the same thing happened, and so he restores Rebecca to Isaac. Then we have various things taking place in this chapter that we don't want to get into. Um, we'll start there next time with chapter 27, how Jacob secures Esau's blessings. Now he uses guile. I've heard a lot of sermons preached on Abraham's lie to Pharaoh about his wife being his sister, and it wasn't a lie. She was his half-sister. I've heard other sermons preached on chapter 27 of uh, Jacob's deceit. I just refuse to use those terms because the Bible doesn't. He does use guile on, on Esau. He first got him to sell his birthright, but he still has to get the blessing from Isaac before he dies because the custom was, and this is one other use of the laying on of hands, the father would lay hands on the children at, well, near his death when he knew he was about to pass on, if he could do that, you know, and wasn't accidentally killed, and pass on the blessings. And the blessings that are passed on through the chosen line coming through Shem, those are prophecies which will be fulfilled. They spoke by the inspiration of the Spirit. And so Isaac, or rather Jacob, has to get Isaac's blessing. You see, he may get the birthright from Esau, but he still has to get the blessing from Jacob, which will be a prophecy. So, I mean, from Isaac. And so he uses guile, he and his mother, and uh, pretends he's pretends he is Esau. Now, let me hasten to add, the ethics of the Old Testament are not those of the New. And uh, the methods are Jacob's, the election is God's.